Welcome to the 16th Annual Symposium on St. Thomas Aquinas, sponsored by the Joyce McMahon Hank, Aquinas Chair in Catholic Theology, one of two endowed professorships at St. Mary's dedicated to St. Thomas and made possible through the generosity of Joyce McMahon Hank, St. Mary's class of 1952. My name is Joseph Incandela, and I'm pleased to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Lisa Sol Cahill, the J. Donald Monin Professor of Theology at Boston College, is one of the most prominent and prolific Catholic ethicists writing today. She has over 200 articles and 20 books to her credit, and is past president of both the Society of Christian Ethics and the Catholic Theological Society of America, and recipient in 2008 of the latter's highest award, the John Courtney Murray Award. The scope of her scholarly concerns is truly staggering, including matters pertaining to gender and sexuality, feminism, bioethics, genetics, reproductive ethics, ethics of the family, healthcare ethics, social and global ethics, uh, ethics of war and peace, and others that I'm sure I'm leaving out. Throughout such disparate topics, explorations of justice and the common good frequently recur in her writings as theological touchstones and unifying themes. Accompanying these appeals to lived experience and the contribution of natural law discourse to vital matters of public good enhance her reputation as, in one commentator's words, a bridge builder intent on making connections between different theological traditions, perspectives, and methodologies, always with an eye toward shaping the broader conversation about faith and ethics." Close quote. Perhaps most impressively, in an era given to sound bites and dismissive labeling of positions, is how successfully her own work resists such reductiveness. Professor Cahill is no stranger to St. Mary's College. In April 1992, she delivered the eighth Madaliba Lecture in Spirituality. That lecture, Women and Sexuality, became a book of the same name published by Paulus Press. In April 2000, she was here again for the historic gathering of all Madaliba lecturers, whose reunion produced the prophetic statement known as the Madaliba Manifesto, a message of hope and courage to women in the church. I note the good sense of both previous invitations to bring our speaker to northern Indiana in the month of April, rather than in the much more medieval feeling month of January, which despite its many and all too evident flaws, remains probably the more appropriate time to celebrate the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, as we did this past Monday. One line of the Madaliva Manifesto struck me as particularly apt to repeat tonight. The Madaliva lecturers wrote, to women who suffer the cost of discipleship, we say, you are not alone. We remember those who have gone before us, who first held up for us the pearl of great price, the richness of Catholic thought and spirituality, we give thanks to those who continue to mentor us." Close quote. In many of her published writings, even as Lisa Cable has fully acknowledged the very ambiguous legacy bequeathed by St. Thomas Aquinas for matters pertaining to gender and sexuality, she has nonetheless paid him the great compliment, as Thomas himself paid to others, of entering into conversation with him to mine earlier wisdom and extend it in service to the faith. Throughout her career, Lisa Cahill has resolutely explored the richness of the Catholic tradition and reclaimed many pearls of great price for critical purchase on contemporary ethical issues and human experience of the moral life. We are truly honored and delighted to have her with us this evening. After her remarks, Professor Cahill has graciously agreed for some dialogue with your questions. I ask that we leave space for the first few questions to come from the St. Mary students that are in the room. We will then open it up to everyone, and afterwards we'll adjourn for a reception in the back of the room. The title of the talk this evening is Aquinas and Natural Law, Resources for Women's Equality. Please join me in welcoming back to St. Mary's College, Dr. Lisa Solkin.
So as Dr. Iskandela just explained, the topic of my uh, remarks tonight is Aquinas and Natural Law, Resources for Women's Equality. And I'd like to just start out by offering thanks, as I'm sure many previous lectures have done, not only to Dr. Iskandela, but also to Joyce McMay and Hank, class of 1952, who endowed not only this lecture, but also two Aquinas chairs. Because she saw Thomas Aquinas as her intellectual mentor. I wish she were here tonight so that I could ask her why and how Aquinas attracted her back in the 1950s and whether he has served her well in the intervening 61 years. Back in 1952, what we think of as contemporary feminism, much less feminist theology, was not yet on the intellectual horizon of U.S. culture as a whole or of Catholic colleges, although U.S. women had won the vote in 1920. Men's and women's social and familial roles continued to be unequal for decades after that, inspiring a resurgence of movements for women's equality in the 60s and 70s. Among Catholics, Rosemary Radford Ruther was one of the first theologians to take up the cause. Writing in her landmark book, Sexism and God Talk, 1983, that the critical principle of feminist theology is the promotion of the full humanity of women. Therefore, she said, whatever diminishes or denies the full humanity of women must be presumed not to reflect the divine or an authentic relation to the divine, or to reflect the authentic nature of things, or to be the message or work of an authentic redeemer, or a community of redemption. My thesis tonight, basically, is that Rosemary Ruther's feminist rallying call is in fact the essence of Aquinas' ethics of the natural law, expressed in terms of its relevance for women. St. Mary's College has a proud track record in furthering women's success through education and advocacy in both society and church. Sister Madeleine Wolf, president of the college from 1934 to 61, instituted a graduate theology program for Catholic women and lay men in 1943. It was the first in the country. Yet despite women's undeniable social, educational, and economic progress in the intervening decades, women and men are still not treated equally even in this country. As recently as last September, the sociologist Stephanie Kunst published an article in the New York Times arguing that in many ways the progress of U.S. women has actually stalled. The number of women with degrees in technology has fallen almost to the 1970 level. Women make up almost 40% of full-time management personnel, but women managers earn only 73% of the salaries paid to men. Only a third of the new partners at big law firms last year were women. And women make up only 4% of the CEOs in Fortune's top 1,000 companies. Women's average earnings are still lower than men's, and women are more likely to be poor in America. Within the Catholic Church, of course, men have access to more positions of power and authority than women. Despite the entrance of women into theological education, pastoral ministries, and administrative roles in U.S. dioceses, only two women hold top administrative positions in the Vatican even though most such positions do not require ordination. And back in our own country, the Leadership Conference of Women Religious is under investigation by the Vatican, which wants the nuns to dedicate less time to social justice and more to enforcing orthodox positions on sexual morality. Women are being educated for self-respect, achievement, and social contribution at St. Mary's. But the realities of the world after graduation may come as a shock, particularly as you move farther along your vocational trajectory. Therefore, advocacy for women's equality, which is the definition of feminism, 
is still much needed in 2013. Can our Catholic tradition be a help in that regard? Certainly, Thomas Aquinas is one of its most notable figures, one who continues to inspire a vast quantity of theological and ethical work today. But what is Aquinas' track record on women? About midway through his 30-plus page Aquinas course syllabus, Professor Joe Incandela asks, <laughs> what did St. Thomas say about women? Can feminists possibly claim his, him as an ally, possibly as italicized in the original? Or is he the ultimate proponent of an androcentric patriarchal theology? To be honest, Aquinas' record is mixed. But for this very reason, he can serve as a good illustration of how traditions come forward to address new questions through a process of critical reinterpretation that both retrieves and reinvents. Feminist thinkers often characterize their project as partly the search for what we call a usable past. As we look at our histories and traditions, we must be honest and accurate about what we do and do not find Sometimes that means uncovering the hidden record of women's achievements or showing why a supposedly misogynist thinker has been misrepresented. But it also means confronting the dark <coughs> shadows thrown by our intellectual and cultural edifices or uncovering the clay feet of our heroes. Aquinas' basic account of the nature and role of women is developed as a commentary on the creation of humanity <coughs> in Genesis. Why did God make woman, he asks. Unavoidably, but in this case, unfortunately, Aquinas' reading of Genesis is highly influenced by long-standing Christian traditions of women's subordination, by then-dominant cultural expectations, by philosophical explanations of women's inferiority, and by the biological ideas of Aristotle. I will explain all this in more detail in a moment, and I will also indicate how a modern feminist would reread the same biblical text to support the equality of men and women. First, however, let me highlight some additional points to be made about Aquinas and the equality of women. Although Aquinas explains the creation of women in terms of inequality, there are other indications in his works that, perhaps because of personal experience, he came from a big family of brothers and sisters, he did not really view women so negatively. No, he did not directly challenge the inherited view of women as less than men. However, he did affirm the spiritual gifts of women. He viewed the union of woman and man in marriage as the most intense of friendships. And he argued that social practices like polygamy, adultery, divorce, and childbearing outside marriage are wrong because they are unfair to women. We will look at these further as well. In the bigger picture, however, it is not Aquinas' specific comments on women that constitute his biggest contribution to the cause of women's equality. Rather, that contribution lies, I believe, in his specific approach to justice, human dignity, and the common good. The Thomistic theory of the natural law, as I see it, includes at least half a dozen dimensions that are relevant to the equality of women worldwide. One, there is a common human nature from which moral values can be inferred. That is the natural moral law. Two, there is an inductive and thus, thus partly contingent and revisable approach to moral knowledge. Thirdly, there is an interpretation of moral wrongdoing as the violation of human well-being and as sinful. Fourth, the power of God's love heals and transforms our natural human capacities. Fifth, Aquinas has a relatively optimistic or hopeful view of social historical change. And sixth, the ability to assimilate and adapt to new and culturally different perspectives and insights is modeled by his appropriation of Aristotle. All these are important to feminist theology and greater equality for women. 
For a viable global feminist theology and ethics, it is important to say that one, Women and men in all cultures share the same human nature and are accountable to value the same basic goods for all. Two, knowing the human goods and how to realize them is an ongoing and dialogical process, so our views of gender and its moral meaning can rightly change. Three, to, de to deny women's personal and social equality is a violation of human dignity and the common good, and it is also a sin which implies that we can and ought to change it. Fourth, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God offers us the possibility of renewed gender relations. Recall Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Fifth, both the goodness of created nature and the power of redeeming grace make it possible for the long-standing injustice of patriarchy to change in society. And finally, just as Aquinas reshaped theology and ethics, <coughs> in light of his appreciation of Aristotle, so can we renew our traditions in dialogue with global women's voices and theologies. Now let's develop these points a bit more with specific reference to Aquinas' writings. And in the conclusion to this talk, I am going to illustrate the, the relevance that I see in his theory of natural law with the case of sex trafficking and uh, global and Christian efforts to combat it. So probably the longest discussion uh, of Aquinas on women occurs in his discussion of the Genesis creation stories. Um, these, this discussion occurs in his major work, the Summa Theologiae, uh, under the topic of the production of the woman. In the first part of his discussion, he asks the question whether women should even have been made uh, in the original creation. The reason that one might think otherwise, he says, is that obviously a man can be more efficiently helped by another man in most other works that he has to accomplish. However, he does need a helper in the work of generation, meaning procreation. So therefore, it was necessary to have women. <coughs> so as regards human nature in general, it is certainly important that women are included. And so women, in fact, are included in the first creation in order to accomplish the work of generation. On the other hand, however, Aquinas says that if we just look at the nature of individual women, not whether they're necessary for the species as a whole, we have to recognize that, and I quote, woman is defective and misbegotten. For the active force in the male seed tends to the production of a perfect likeness in the masculine sex, while the production of woman comes from defect in the active force or for, from some material indisposition, or even from some external influence, such as that of a south wind, which is moist. Bizarre as that theory may seem to us today, he is actually repeating the um, um, you know, biological science of the philosopher Aristotle. And we have to remember that in the day of Aristotle and Aquinas, uh, no one knew about the ovum and its uh, role in the process of creating a child. So what Aquinas was really trying to figure out is how the male sperm, in which it was generally regarded, uh, was contained, uh, the human being in miniature, the perfect form of which is a male, how could that possibly turn into a female so that we have two sexes? And so uh, Aristotle and then Aquinas postulates that uh, some ill influence was involved. And so the, uh, the development of a female nature is, to, is a departure from the perfect norm. But considering the needs of the species as a whole, it is still a good thing that women were created. Aquinas then goes on to ask, whether it was appropriate that women had, should have been made from the man, because we know in Genesis 2 
that God cast the first man into his sleep, then creates the woman from uh, the man's rib. And on this, Aquinas says that it was more suitable for the woman to be made from the man in order to give the first man a certain dignity. So that's kind of a sexist explanation. I think we would all agree. Aquinas, though, has another reason that sounds better to us with our current appreciation of the proper relation of man and woman. And his second reason is that it is good that uh, the woman is taken from the man's nature so that man might love woman all the more and cleave to her more closely, knowing her to be fashioned from himself. This is key because male and female are united, not just for generation, but for the whole purpose of domestic life. Uh, and so in this context, it's very important that the male and female uh, be made from the same nature. Aquinas goes on to explore this a bit further still by asking whether the woman was fittingly made from the rib of man. And I'm sure you have heard many explanations of women's inferiority based on the fact that she was taken from Adam's rib. Commendably, Aquinas does not resort to this explanation. Instead, he says that it is right for the woman to be made from a rib of man to signify their social union. He, she is taken from his side so that they can stand side by side, not from his head uh, so that she is superior, or from his feet so that she is his servant. Um, and he also points out that both Adam and Eve were formed immediately by God through God's own personal creative action, even though the woman was taken from uh, the rib of the man. He says, um, God alone could produce either a man from the slime of the earth or a woman from the rib of man. And I won't go into this a lot further, but I would just like to recommend to you a wonderful book. It's not a new book. It's by a Lutheran feminist biblical scholar named Phyllis Tribble. She wrote a book called God and the Rhetoric of Sexuality in which she comments on these same stories. And she makes some of the same points as Aquinas, actually. Uh, specifically, um, that uh, the, um, the individual creative act of God gives a certain um, equality of nature to the man and the woman. Uh, and that the fact that they are made of the same stuff um, creates their common nature, and that is the basis of their partnership together. She also says, rather amusingly, however, that we can see, certainly see an order in the uh, progress of creation. After all, the man was taken from the slime of the earth, and the woman was taken from the man's rib. Um, she also <laughs> notes that in the first creation story, the order of creatures made is from lower, from inanimate creatures, to the animals, <laughs> to the man. And then finally in Genesis 2, to the crown of creation, the woman. So she, she says this rather jokingly. Her real point is that uh, the biblical stories and uh, the tradition as well uh, should see them as created to be an equal relationship. Now, in Aquinas, although he does have this sort of original outlay of view of women as less rational than man um, and as created to be subordinate to male guidance, even though not male servant or slave. He does have other places in his writings, in the Summa, where he gives more positive hints about women. And I'm just going to quickly mention three of these. The first is the gifts of the spirit. The second is sexual justice and injustice. And the third is relationship in marriage. It is never in dispute for Aquinas that women are equally the recipients of the saving theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. So the issue is not so much equality before God in the order of redemption as equality by nature in the order of society. The more negative aspects of Aquinas for the equality of women concern their social roles, as we just heard with the commentary on Genesis. So there's some other context then, as I just mentioned, where he continues to develop this. And one of the places is when he is talking about the fact that in the church, the Holy Spirit inspires individual persons with the gift of wisdom and the gifts of the Spirit. 
for the good of the church. And he remarks that the grace of wisdom is given both to women and to men, although he adds that women may only teach privately to one or a few or in familiar conversation and not by publicly addressing the whole church. So he has the limitation of social role in the church. Women are not to be public leaders and teachers in the church. Yet, at the same time, notice, he does not base that on inequality of the actual spiritual gift of wisdom. So you see there's more a social limit than an inherent limit or a limit in the way that women experience the spirit's gifts. Another area uh, in which this topic comes up is regarding sexual justice and violations of justice toward women. And this one also gets off on a bad footing, let me warn you, but we'll try to pick it up after that. One of the more notorious positions of Aquinas on sex is that the primary natural purpose of sex is procreation. Therefore, he concludes, sexual sins that prevent procreation are worse than any other kind. As a consequence, we find him saying rather incredibly that homosexuality, masturbation, and contraception are worse than rape, incest, and adultery, all of which are more likely to be committed against women, and two of which involve coercion and violence. However, in um, a work that he wrote called the uh, Summa Contra Gentiles, which is a summary of thought uh, meant for addressing uh, people outside of Christianity, he brings in some other considerations about the situation of men in the wom and women in the world in which he seems to be much more attentive uh, to the offenses uh, of justice against women in the sexual area and uh, does not limit his analyses of these sins to the uh, possibility or not of procreation. So for instance, he says um, in the third volume of this work that no sex outside of marriage, that there should be no sex outside of marriage because it would leave a mother and child without support. Also, there should be no divorce because it would be unfair to women to be left alone when they are older and if they were, it would reduce women to a virtual state of servitude and create an injustice in their position as compared to men. He also says, uh, much more compellingly to us, that incest is wrong, not, um, uh, uh, well, that incest is wrong because it is a violation of the dignity of a family member to whom one should give the most respect. So he takes the emphasis off of the possibility of appropriation. In a final area, um, he talks about the kind of relationship that is a marriage and um, regards it as a very special friendship. He has a question, again, back in the Summa Theologiae, in which he is discussing charity and the order of loves among human beings. And he asks, uh, who should we love more, like parents, brother and sister, or spouse? Of course, he presents this from the man's point of view. But he says a man should love his parents more than his wife because they love, he loves them as his origin, and they should be considered as a more exalted good. He adds, though, that on the part of the type of union considered in itself, the wife ought to be loved more because she is united with her husband as one flesh. Consequently, a man loves his wife more intensely, but his parents with greater reverence. He uh, says also in the same discussion, um, very directly, that the principal reason why a man loves his wife is her being united to him in the flesh. So I think what we can draw from this is that he sees the marriage relationship as a special kind of friendship, which is in fact the most intense kind of human love because of their sexual union. So you start to see that he appreciates that sex is not just about procreation. And the union of husband and wife is not just about their having children, as you seem to get the impression back in the discussion of Genesis. 
Okay, now I would like to move to the um, second part of this, which is on the natural law, and ask what else is to be discovered in Aquinas beyond the specific texts on gender relations. Aquinas's theory of the natural law applied equitably with a 20th century lens to equality for women is a major resource for feminist theology and ethics. Under his theory of the natural law, Aquinas affirms that there is one human nature shared by everyone. Also, that there are common moral values which can be known across cultures. He also thinks that there is a basic notion of justice for all, which has reference to our sharing in fundamental human goods. At the same time, he has openness to a global scope of the discussion and even to cultural diversity. And very importantly for many of the dire problems we confront today, he has hope for actual historical change. Aquinas uh, in the Summa Theologiae has a set of uh, questions or discussions which are generally termed the treatise on law. And one of these questions is devoted <coughs> to the subject of the natural law. Therein, Aquinas affirms that the basic principle of orienting or defining the very nature of all morality is do good and avoid evil. That principle, he says, is self-evident to reason, and it's really kind of tautological, which means um, it states something which is obvious uh, but doesn't fill out too much of the content. So what I mean by that is, he says, uh, do good and avoid evil, or the good is that which should be sought, and the evil is that which should be avoided. But to say the good should be sought is already evident from the nature of the meaning of the good. Of course the good is what should be sought, that's why we call it good. So the big challenge is really to fill out and define, okay, what is good? You know, what does constitute human flourishing? and what is a violation of it. And here, Aquinas directs us more experientially and inductively to the things that all human beings in fact seek, whether personally or across cultures. There are some human goods that are very widely valued. Every culture respects these, although it does so in different ways. And Aquinas uh, gives three examples, and he, uh, explains in the course of um, uh, offering these three areas of goodness that human nature can also be understood in three ways, or on three levels. First of all, we have a nature that we share with all other things, especially living things, and all things seek to preserve their own existence. So he says, if we look at human beings, we can see that human beings value life and all human beings strive to live. All cultures value life. Therefore, protection of life is a basic moral command. He's not denying here that there will be exceptions to that, say self-defense or perhaps war, but he's saying that fundamentally speaking, protection of life is a basic cross-cultural value. Second, he gives an example from the aspect of our nature that we share with other animals or other mammals. And he says that like other animals, human beings uh, mate with other members of their species, uh, procreate, and then educate the young. So uh, uh, sexual intercourse, procreation, and education of children are also human goods that are respected cross-culturally, even though they may be institutionalized differently, for example, in different marriage customs. And then finally, he says, and most importantly, there are some aspects of human beings that are exclusive to humanity. And for Aquinas, these would especially be human rationality and free will. And he says at the human level, we have certain things that are distinctive uh, the examples that he gives are living together in political society and trying to avoid offending the other people with whom we live in such a society. That's one, political society. And the other, interestingly, is seeking to know the truth about God. 
it, it's fascinating to me that he did not say religion or to be religious, but seeking to know whether there is a God, who is God, what is God, and what is God's relation to humanity. And that's certainly something that we find among all peoples and all cultures. For Aquinas, the details of these goods are not developed very specifically, at least not in this initial discussion. He acknowledges that uh, realization of these goods concretely, protection of life, sex and raising children, political society, and religious inquiry, that these can vary culturally and may change. In fact, he says specifically that the reason by which we know morality is not a speculative abstract reason. It's a practical reason. It's a reason that's always engaged. We know about morality, we learn about morality as we actually make moral decisions, engage and navigate through moral conflicts, make choices about priorities of goods. So he says the practical reason, the moral reason, and I'll use his language, is busied with contingent matters about which human actions are concerned. And therefore, although there is necessity in the general principles, the more we descend to matters of detail, the more frequently we encounter defects. And by defects, it just means a departure from general norms. Although, obviously, he's not denying that people make mistakes and act sinfully. But he's even saying with regard to the natural law, you've got general norms and then you've got a variety of application. So he says, in matters of action, truth or practical rectitude is not the same for all as to matters of detail, but only as to the general principles. And where there is the same rectitude, it's not equally known by all. Another important aspect of Aquinas' theory of the natural law, which is very important uh, for global uh, justice for women, is that he prioritizes the common good and justice. For Aquinas, justice is a virtue that governs right relations in society, and it gets the longest treatment of any virtue in the Summa. Justice is both a personal and a social virtue, and human law should be based on justice. Aquinas um, uh, separates out the parts of justice in terms of general justice, or the relation of the person to the common good, particular justice, the relation, uh, the just relation of particular persons or persons to goods, and that again can concern either relations between people or the, distribu or the distribution of goods among people. And today, or saying contemporary Catholic social teaching, we tend to put all these together or to see their integration when we speak of social justice, which was not a term Aquinas himself used. So now I'm going to start moving up into the contemporary period, discuss some of the, just really quickly, some uh, recent developments and additions, if you will, to this uh, theory of the natural law, and then move right on to my example of sex trafficking. So um, modern Catholic social teaching is a tradition of taking encyclicals that started in the late 19th century. And I won't go into the whole thing, but I will hold up some uh, common values or ideals that these encyclicals espouse. And they do come, generally speaking, out of this tradition of the natural law. So key to Catholic social teaching are the dignity of the person and the common good mutual rights and responsibilities, the responsibility of all to contribute to the common good, and the right of all to share in the common good. Um, the common good is understood not just in terms of local communities or nation states, but today even universally and globally. And one of the documents of Vatican II, Gaudium et Spes, defines the common good in this way. Those conditions of social life which allows social groups and their individual members relatively thorough and ready access to their own fulfillment. As we move past Vatican II and into more recent popes, Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI, we find an increasing incorporation of biblical themes along with the natural law foundation. And I just want to highlight two very important um, refinements, again, 
crucial for justice for women globally. The first is the so-called preferential option for the poor, and the second is solidarity, especially global solidarity. Um, for, for example, of the preferential option for the poor, which means that um, although all persons should be treated equally, uh, our attention should go first and foremost to those who are most left out of the common good. So first we take care of those who are most marginal and we should be in solidarity with them. And John Paul II defines what he calls the option or love of preference for the poor in the following way. It is an option or a special form of primacy in the exercise of Christian charity, but it applies equally to our social responsibilities. So he, it's both the gospel, but also the natural law and justice. This love of the preference for the poor and the decisions which it inspires in us cannot but embrace the immense multitudes of the hungry, the needy, the vulnerable. John Paul II also gives us a good definition of solidarity when he says, solidarity is not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because we are all really responsible for all. According to Catholic feminist theologian Christina Trena, Aquinas' theory of basic human goods is very important here because it helps indicate for us the nature of the human good and of human flourishing that we are seeking when we enact uh, natural justice, the preferential option for the poor, and also the virtue of solidarity. For Trena, Aquinas' natural law theory can be expressed today in terms of the human flourishing of all people and of the goods necessary to flourish. As some examples, she gives adequate nourishment, clothing, shelter and medical care, safe working conditions, meaningful work, adequate income, relationships that are just, supportive and intimate, and either egalitarian or aimed at egalitarianism. Opportunities for education, expression, participation, and creativity in religious community. Access to education, full membership in a community of, of morality and accountability, and a general atmosphere of respect for all persons in all of these dimensions. Now let me move uh, in the final part of this uh, lecture to sex trafficking as a concrete example. And here I'm going to be drawing from Catholic authors who have written about this problem, uh, drawing on many of the values of the natural law as well as Catholic social teaching and the gospel commitment to the preferential option and solidarity. For Aquinas, Respect for women's welfare, or justice for women, would certainly um, not amount to saying that women are perfectly equal. Also, women's situation specifically is not a priority on his ethical landscape. However, when Aquinas discusses sexual sin, almost exclusively under the category of male lust, he lays the ground for a more proactive approach. Certainly Aquinas, with his emphasis on procreative sex in permanent loving marriage, would never have condoned sex trafficking. However, it is only when we recognize women's full equality that we make it a priority Moreover, we also need the preferential option for the vulnerable and active solidarity to motivate real action for change 
in this vast area of abuse of women's human rights. Catholics working to combat the exploitation of women and children in the sex trade are motivated by the, prefer by the preferential option and solidarity as supported by the gospel. However, explicitly or implicitly, they also presuppose something like Aquinas' natural moral law when they form alliances across cultures and religions and see sexual exploitation as a deplorable human problem. What is human trafficking? So in the discussion of human trafficking to follow, and including with this initial dis, uh, definition that I'm about to give, I'm going to draw on uh, a little book that was published last year called Human Trafficking. It was uh, published as part of an international uh, theological series called Concilium. I was one of the editors, along with two other women, uh, one from New Zealand and one from Germany. And uh, the one of the first authors in the book actually teaches here in Notre Dame. His name is Dan Grudy. He's done a lot of work on liberation theology and the preferential option for the poor. There were uh, international authors also represented in this volume, and I will be quoting a couple of those. So according to Dan Grudy, human trafficking is a tremendously profitable industry, and it's also a form of modern-day slavery. It ensnares up to 27 million people into forced labor, including sex work. More people are enslaved today than at any other time in human history, which is a fact that I found completely incredible. Because in terms of modern rights discourse, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, the Convention on the Protection of the Children, we have all this public rhetoric. And yet at the concrete level, there are more people existing in slavery than at any other time in human history. In the United States in 1850, you could buy a human being for the equivalent of about $40,000, certainly much less than the worth of a human life. But today, a slave can be bought for an average of about $100. More than a million children a year are sold into the global sex trade. Human trafficking worldwide reaps in money in excess of $32 billion a year. Sex trafficking, of course, does not include all prostitution, but only the coerced sale of one's body for the gain of another. Sex trafficking often overlaps with debt bondage. Women and girls are forcibly prostituted, then held captive until their work pays off a debt set by the traffickers. This happens because the promise of better work, education, or marriage sometimes lures people initially, but the migrants are then forced to work in strip clubs, pornography businesses, or prostitution. For example, a young woman named Anita came as a migrant from Nigeria through Ghana to Italy. She would move through Turin, Rome, and Milan, places that maybe some of us have spent junior year abroad or taught summer courses or gone on vacation. Anita, however, was forced in these cities to have sex with more than 25 men a day. She underwent various kinds of mental and physical torture, including crude abortions, multiple rapes by her traffickers, starvation, beatings, and threats of deportation if she complained to authorities. As Grudy insists, these crimes violate basic human rights and call for a global ethics. He echoes the essential meaning of the natural moral law when he declares, these victims cry to heaven for justice as they suffer a crime against their humanity. Trafficking also weakens communities, fragments nations, increases global health risks, feeds networks of organized crimes, worsens levels of poverty, and impedes integral human development. So trafficking not only violates the dignity of human persons 
it tears apart the common good. In a 2002 speech, John Paul II said, the trade on human persons constitutes a shocking offense against human dignity and a grave violation of fundamental human rights, very natural law language. Such situations are an affront to fundamental values which are shared by all cultures and people, values rooted in the very nature of the human person. In 2000, the U.S. adopted the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and the U.N. adopted an anti-trafficking protocol known as the Palermo Protocol. International efforts generally follow the three Ps of prosecution of traffickers, protection of the trafficked, and prevention of further victimization. However, new laws and policies very frequently go unenforced. As Agnes Brizal of the Philippines points out, even as the Catholic Church condemns trafficking, it fails to condemn the sense of male entitlement that feeds it. Trafficking is often part of organized crime. Law enforcement officials may give it a low priority, especially in areas where the status of women is very unequal. Law enforcement may look the other way or even take bribes. Often, prosecution amounts to arresting prostitutes while letting their owners go free, then re-victimizing the women. Agnes Brazal, the Catholic Filipina theologian, has written a, a, an essay on the positive side of the work that the Catholic Church is doing for social change, not so much via teaching from above, but via the, the grassroots work of faith-based uh, organizations and communities. Her country, the Philippines, is the fourth among countries in number of children trafficked for prostitution. The Philippines includes at least 18 centers run by the Roman Catholic Church to serve sexually violated women. Twelve of these are run by women's religious congregations. Five are ecumenical ventures between Catholics and Protestants, and one is run by a Roman Catholic diocese. So again, once again, and as usual, it is the Catholic nuns who are stepping out ahead of the pack and running two-thirds of these organizations. Brazil discusses several images in light of which the church might see its mission in this work. She takes up the church as good shepherd, and she says that we have a biblical model of the good shepherd who cares for all of his sheep and treats them all equally. She says, though, that the downside of this is that it implies that the trafficked women and girls are passive victims, as dumb as sheep and as little able to fend for themselves. Another image is the church as mother. Um, that is helpful to a certain extent, but it doesn't address the male point of view in the Roman Catholic Church, where prostitution and trafficking are condemned but not the patriarchy and sexism behind them, of which the church, too, is guilty. Another possible image, the church as family. Unfortunately, though, families are sometimes the ones who have sold or pressured their daughters to become sex workers, often because the family is so desperately poor that that seems the only means of sustenance. Agnes Brazal herself suggests the image of the church as a bridge of solidarity. Um, solidarity, uh, in, in sort of, again, the vein of the natural law, indicates a human and social capacity that is instigated and nourished by the church or, or the gospel, but is not limited only to Christians. Brazal also says that the bridges aspect of her metaphor shows that we can and should provide a space to talk about differences. Bridges, she says, facilitate the crossing of geographical, social, economic, political, cultural, and religious divisions to reach values and goals that all can commit to. 
A bridge of solidarity, then, helps us see other persons not as victims, but as our neighbors. It also helps move, move toward collaboration with other religions, governments, and NGOs. Finally, for Agnes Brazal, solidarity means empowerment. Survivors of sex trafficking are no longer just victims, but sisters and partners. The Catholic centers, especially those run by sisters, teach uh, the women professional skills and life skills and offer them education. Says Agnes Brazal, their main aim is to empower the women and girls and help them assert themselves to prevent further victimization. In conclusion, then, the method of Christian feminist theology is to test everything and hold fast to what is good, as St. Paul advised the church at Thessalonica when it was trying to discern the true from the false prophets. We have tested Thomas Aquinas and can hold on to some of his ideas about women as good, as well as the essence of his view of the natural law, which I regard as very good. Yet St. Paul also told the Thessalonians, do not quench the spirit. The Holy Spirit continues to speak anew in every age and will certainly bring new wisdom to challenge not a few old certainties. Today, in new ways of thinking, we bring several things to Aquinas. First, the modern value, which is key to 21st century ethics and that is equality and mutual respect. Secondly, after Vatican II, the reinvigoration of ethics by scripture, especially in the form of the preferential option and solidarity. And finally, a global consciousness, where we are aware of our differences and respect differences, but still work towards shared agendas. In addition, for feminist theology and for natural law ethics today as concerned with the equality of women, it is crucial to listen to the experience of women. And I believe that the experience of women lifts up four priorities for Catholic feminist natural law ethics. The first is to lift women's experiences, sufferings, capabilities, and contributions out of the shadows of a male-dominated world. The second is to make a preferential option for, but also to be in solidarity with, women who suffer the most burdensome sorts of abuse, such as sex trafficking. Thirdly, we must always listen globally in a diverse conversation of women and allow new perspectives to enlarge our own ideas. And finally, we call all women and men in faith communities to seek human flourishing for all worldwide with an appreciation of the realities of sin and evil, but also with a confident hope that changes are really possible. Thank you. to um, re-look at Thomas Aquinas 
Ottawa work for feminists, even though I don't know if you would uh, necessarily agree with what right. you're saying. Yeah. So can I respond to that, or did you say there should be a fight? Yeah, okay. That's a really good question because it's really at the heart of what feminist theology does, or really any sort of modern theology that uses the tradition. And I think what we often find ourselves doing, not just with Aquinas, but with anyone else from the tradition, is we always go back to it with our own hermeneutic. So I would say it's virtually impossible to just get inside their head in their historical period. So, you know, what we generally do is, um, you know, we're grounded in a tradition that involves scripture, tradition, experience, philosophy, the sciences, and these all go together to create our own hermeneutic and worldview. And with that, we reach back. And so I think what we do is select the most life-giving and promising elements of our traditions, whether it's scripture or Aquinas or Augustine or Hildegard of Bingen, and then move on with that. And so I don't think that the, um, the, the task, I guess, is to just be faithful to what they said, although that does have a place in historical studies. So if you're a, a church historian or a, 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 you know, a historian of Catholic theology, the first thing is just to figure out what they actually said, but even then, we're still doing it from a vantage point. But for constructive theology and ethics, that's just what you have to do. And there may be some people that some will just decide to leave behind and jettison. There's a lot of Christians that don't really like this natural law thing because they want to see Christian ethics as solely indebted to the gospel and is not really intelligible to anyone outside the church. Stanley Hauerwas, who I heard was going to be here soon, would be a theologian who takes that perspective. So I'm, I'm advocating this, you know, Aquinas. or in an initiative that the Holy Cross sisters had recently. So there's certainly opportunities to discuss all these things. All that data that I read at the beginning from Stephanie Kuntz about the unequal work situations of men and women right here today in North America, or talking to people from other cultures. I see some religious women uh, maybe from other countries. So I think the opportunities are there. And for me, and this is also very consistent with what the natural law tradition does, you know, it, it's, it's not always a matter, uh, you know, right off the bat of talking with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, but we can talk about our common human nature or, or, you know, values. What values can we share and how should we be accountable to other people and let it go from there. And then, you know, really we should be the most concerned about those who are the least well off. We really need to experience the feeling of solidarity. I can imagine ways in which that all those things would come up in the debate going right on, going on right here today in our own country over immigration. You know, like look at some of the stuff on the U.S. Fish's website, which advocates these same principles. So um, I do think there are ways, you know, that it's very related to ordinary experience. I'm wondering about the concept of complement, gender complementarity, and yeah. if that has any um, roots in Aquinas' uh, thinking, and if you think that the contemporary conversation is about uh, affirming equality or about maintaining inequality. Gender complementarity is very tricky. Okay, so, I mean, just a couple of quick things. There's a whole discussion about complementarity within Catholic documents, which has its own set of complicated and very political issues. And then there's a, also a discussion about uh, complementarity, or at least gender difference, that goes on in the social and natural sciences, or even looking at the similarities between humans and other animals. 
There's also feminist studies that have been done on actual gender differences, how great they are, and the uh, you know, levels of difference within each sex as well as between. So the first thing I would want to say is that I don't know if I would dismiss out, out of hand any idea of gender difference. I do think that gender difference has been exaggerated in most cultures to limit women's access to the same variety of roles that are open to men. And some of the psychological studies and so on have shown that there may be some gender differences, but not so much that women should only have certain roles and men other roles. One of the things that's most disputed um, on the basis of the scientific evidence is whether there are some gender differences related to biological procreative roles. So this is where you start getting closer to the Catholic debate on complementarity. But certainly in other animals, mammals, females and males behave differently in caring for young, etc. So, you know, does that affect human females and males at all? How reliable is it? I certainly would say, even if it's there, it's very highly socially constructed on top of whatever nature might be involved. In the Catholic tradition, there, the current teaching, so just to look at that, so actually Benedict XVI has not written much on this of anything, so it really goes to John Paul II. And he was always in what to me is a little bit of an ambivalent, if not schizophrenic situation <laughs> of trying to argue both that men and women are equal in family and society, there should be equal pay for equal work, women should have access to all public roles, et cetera, and to say that motherhood is women's most important role. Uh, there's also this huge, like, um, I don't know, philosophy or theology of uh, women's and men's personalities that then gets translated in terms of roles in the church. And, you know, all women have a nurturing personality and all men have, you know, I don't know, whatever, uh, uh, personalities, <laughs> types of leadership in the church that are not open to women. And when people start to hear it go down that road, you begin to wonder, I begin to wonder whether the theory has really been devised to protect a certain you know, set of arrangements in the church and that it's not a theory that's really looking at empirical evidence or social evidence. So I'll just leave it at that. You know, I wouldn't rule complementarity out totally. I'd rather speak of difference and I don't think difference should be exaggerated. Okay, so my question is actually kind of uh, in contrast to hers, but my question is if you could elaborate for us like various ways in talking about like you know human sex human sex trafficking and things yeah. like that. You know, there's the idea that there are poor people and then there's the other word for it is impoverished. You know, there's the difference like a cycle like a thinking about how poor people are disjointed from us or those, those people that are impoverished, there's, there's a connection because that means we're participating in their, yeah, yeah, and yeah, how they are. the structural conditions. Yeah, and I wonder if you can, because um, people who are, that participate in the trafficking are usually minorities of the LGBTQ community, are impoverished peoples, or you know, the people that are left to the wayside. So I wonder if there was, oh, isn't a way for us to talk more clearly about those boundaries that we make, so there's a, some kind of disassociation between ourselves. Yeah, and I think that you know, in the sort of sources that I was reading, I think two things like the whole idea of solidarity. So it's not us versus them; it's us together with them. And I think the preferential option for the poor has a lot of that in it. I mean, sometimes or in other lectures, I've said the preferential option for the poor has to be a preferential option for, with, and by the poor. And I think Agnes Brazal was getting at that when she talked about seeing victims, not as passive victims, but as sisters and partners. So that, that's part of it, you know, trying to see us all as in this together. The other thing, though, that, that you know, I took from your comment is that, you know, um, sex trafficking has its causes beyond just sex traffickers being willing to exploit women. Why are women or men or children 
in the situation where they become the victims of sex traffickers. And, you know, I mentioned that sometimes very impoverished families will sell their children. They don't generally just sell them, although sometimes that does happen. But a trafficker will come and they'll like give promises, well, we'll find them a good job in the city. And probably without too much investigation, it would be obvious to everybody that this was a very unsubstantiated promise. But the family is so desperate that they go along with this, and the child winds up in the sex trade. And there's also um, gender expectations. That if the family is starving, it's the daughter's obligation to go and work in the sex trade to send some money back to the family. So there's economic and gender structures, uh, oftentimes in which the customers are from wealthier countries. So it's not just the economic oppression and exclusion uh, from the global economic, uh, you know, set up or global economy. It, it's also that the people who are buying the services are coming from Italy in this one case, or in the United States. Um, uh, Dr. Incandela was talking about how the Holy Cross sisters were demonstrating in Indianapolis uh, when, what, the Super Bowl was here? Yeah. Um, because it draws a lot of people. And those are going to be North Americans by and large. And yet, so there's a huge, uh, you know, uh, nexus of sex trafficking that's going on around the Super Bowl, for goodness sake. So I think looking at all those things is important. You mentioned that Aquinas uh, said that sexual sins are uh, great injustices against women in yeah. particular, and contraception being one of those types of sexual sins, how do you, uh, how do you, I don't want to say justify, but uh, yeah, how do you justify those organizations which help women out of trafficking or yeah. help them in society, yet also promote contraception and the like? You mean they're against contraception? No, no, um, okay. having once worked with an organization that did, uh, help with women's equality. Yeah. I also saw that they did promote contraception as well. So uh, where's the balance there? Was well, I mean, I suppose they were um, trying to promote contraception so that the, woman, the women would have more control over what happened to them sexually, especially if they were ever in a situation where they lacked free choice. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of different organizations, like these Catholic organizations in the Philippines are probably not emphasizing contraception. I don't know whether they completely exclude it, but that would not be their focus. Rather, the focus would be empowering women so that they weren't be victimized. And maybe I would just say that for me, that should always be the priority. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't think I would make it a personal priority to make sure that nobody was offering contraception or advocating contraception. But I don't think that should be the first line of attack because that's not truly empowering. You know, it, maybe contraception can be empowering in some circumstances, but I mean, if you're looking at victimized women, improving their whole set of circumstances, uh, giving them more control over the, their lives and more options, like these organizations in the Philippines were doing, that's really gotta be the first thing. Did you want to say anything else about your experience? I'm not sure I, I was getting like the whole. No, it's just, uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, sisters, uh, Norman, yeah. uh, you know, uh, Catholic sisters yes. who were helping with this uh, yes, problem. Right. Mm -hmm. That this was a particular group of sisters that did empower women, yet also yeah. uh, didn't support the church in its yeah. life of contraception. Yeah. So. I mean, they probably thought that under some circumstances, it was better for the women to have access to the contraceptives than to be open to a pregnancy that they weren't really, um, you know, able to support or a child that they couldn't care for. And there might be differences of opinion, obviously, on whether that would be the right solution. I think it's an understandable point of view. It's not necessarily one that everybody's going to agree with. Uh, to me, it, you know, it wouldn't be the focus. And hopefully it wasn't the focus for these people that you were working with, but the focus was empowering women so that they can say no, you know, and have other alternatives. Thank you. You're all invited back to the
the room by the fireplace uh, to uh, continue the conversation. If you just let uh, Professor Cagle make her way back to the refreshments before you engage her in the conversation. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming out on this uh, less than uh, lovely evening in South Bend, and uh, especially want to thank on your behalf uh, Professor Lisa Sol Cagle for uh, very provocative and interesting remarks. Thank you.